Powell, City Hall Bureau Chief with City and State. Joining me on today's City and State TV is Elizabeth Luskin, the president of the Long Island City Partnership. Thank you for joining us today. My pleasure. So um, tell me a little bit about the, the LIC partnership. Um, you guys seem to be very much in the mix of what's going on in a neighborhood that obviously is, is developing and growing all the time. So tell me a little bit about uh, the background of your organization. So Long Island City Partnership was founded in 79 as the Long Island City Business Development Corporation when the area was really primarily industrial, although there's always been a residential component. And it was formed to, it's a, an LDC, works on both top level economic development, but also a very strong foundation in business services to the businesses in the area. Over the years, as the area became more of a mixed use community, which now has some Fortune 500 companies, everything from class A space to uh, tech space, cultural institutions, obviously a burgeoning residential sector, the partnership morphed into the partnership to reflect um, the diverse community and really the role that uh, we want to play working with all our partners in the area. Mm -hmm. Long Island City is actually quite large. Uh, it used to be its own city before the consolidation of the five boroughs into New York. And uh, But even by a kind of narrow definition, geographically, you're talking about an area roughly from 34th Street to 86th Street, 1st Avenue to 10th Avenue. So it's really Really quite big and most people don't realize that they know the one area of Long Island City that they deal with and so it's our uh, mission to really represent the full diversity of the area and help others to understand it and come up with solutions that can keep the great diverse mix that we have there and strong for not only ourselves but for the city. Now you talked about Long Island City being a former industrial uh, or majority industrial area. So what was the kind of the tipping point in, in you know, LIC becoming a, you know, a mixed use community as you described it? Well, um, a variety of things I think uh, a big thing was the redevelopment of the waterfront which started 30 years ago when Queens West was uh, created. Um, and that's what most people see from Manhattan and elsewhere, those uh, gleaming towers along the waterfront. And now with the city uh, overseeing building out the southern half of, of that Queen, um, Hunters Point South, you're going to have this really full-fledged um, community there. And then in the early 2000s, the zoning was changed to allow mixed-use development along Queens Plaza and in down Jackson Avenue to, to Court Square. And the idea was that a mixed-use community will be a stronger business community as well as um, a good place to live. So between those two things, uh, there was the groundwork laid for a lot of residential. And what's happened post-2008 uh, is a dramatic increase in the amount of construction. Um, there's been some 7,000 units in the last five years or so. There's another 12,000 plus planned, uh, all of which is good. But you haven't seen the complementary commercial development that sure. was anticipated. So there was um, one, uh, two Gotham Center, which was built two million square feet, the Department of Health is in. And you've seen commercial businesses going in, like JetBlue, which we is a fantastic 1,200 employees in Long Island City, go into repurposed former industrial space that's become commercial space. Um, so we've had a tipping point that was intended to add a mixed use element but we want to make sure we don't tip into only becoming residential. Mm -hmm. The industrial sector in Long Island City, like in other parts of the city, there's been a number of good articles about this, is actually quite strong. Um, and the challenge there is not that there aren't companies that want to be here and there aren't goods and services that they provide that the city needs and wants, but that there hasn't been new space created for them. So we do have in Long Island City some industrial business zones which are protected for these areas, but sometimes it's uh, both being because of zoning and because of market forces, it's very hard to create more of that space. So uh, when you look around, it looks like things may be empty. You don't see what's in there. There might be signs that say space available. But a lot of that's really advertising. And what we have is a less than 1% vacancy rate uh, on those kinds of properties. So we've still got room for more residential, but we do need complementary commercial and industrial development. And the challenge is how do we make all that happen in a way that uh, again, as I said, serves the city because the businesses that are there are there because they want to be on the transportation grid, because the nature of their business requires them to be making deliveries or dealing with customers all over the region quickly all the time. Anybody who doesn't need to be in 
the midst of the, the thick of it <laughs> has moved off somewhere else right. where they can have a huge amount of space and pay a lot less for rent. Uh, so the people who are there need to be there. We have more companies who want to be there. And now what we're having is companies that are, uh, need to grow um, or need to stay. And where can they do it? Interesting. And, and with the influx of, of businesses and, and new companies and old companies, what kind of services does the partnership uh, provide to, to these businesses to help them grow or, or just further develop? So through the industrial business zone program, uh, particularly the industrial business, but we also help commercial businesses as well, just in general. Um, if a business comes to us looking for space, we have good connections. We know who may have space, who, what brokers are uh, shopping space around. We know a lot of the owners. We've often been very helpful in helping somebody find the right space. Then there are a number of tax incentives and other kinds of programs through the utilities or through the state which relate to helping you fund build out or hire workers or um, get new equipment. And so we work with companies to try and help identify all of the various programs that they should be taking advantage of and then help them sign up for those programs. Whether we do it directly or we know people who are good at, you know, specialists in a particular program and help them to get that. So you can save hundreds of thousands of dollars a year or sometimes if you're a smaller company less, but it's all money and it's all meaningful. Um, and I should say that the, the part of the value of these companies is that, um, and, the, and the commercial companies as well, is that they provide really good jobs for people. I mean, these are, when you talk about affordable housing, you need a, a wage that allows you to afford affordable housing. And in a lot of these companies, you're starting off at a, at a decent you know, entry point. You get benefits and you have the opportunity to grow. And this is true for people who are all along the educational spectrum. So you take a company like Shapeways, which is one of our new tech companies, the largest 3D printer, I think, in the world. Um, their uh, US uh, operations are headquartered in, in New York and Long Island City. They have everything from you know, MIT PhDs to um, people from LaGuardia Community College because there's jobs in that company that require the full range of skills. But the person entering who perhaps doesn't have that PhD nevertheless has a career path that they can move up with the with the company. And the value of the mixed use community is that, and uh, you, um, you know, it's the, the old thing with demand curves, right? Like if you have residents need things in the mornings and at night, and people who work need things during the day, increasingly, of course, work is a 24 seven activity for a lot of people. But you put all that together, you get more restaurants, you get more entertainment venues, you get more transportation, um, you get all kinds of services that are better for the community as a whole. So you leverage the different sectors to help each other grow. Interesting. Now, I'm glad you brought up affordable housing because I wanted to ask you a, a little bit about how Long Island City kind of fits into the big picture of what Mayor de Blasio wants to do with creating 200,000 units of affordable housing. You mentioned Hunter's Point. Um, I know that's, a, that's already a development in the works, but are there, right. other, are there other areas that are ripe for, for the kind of housing development that the mayor wants to see in Long Island City? Well, I think, you know, as you mentioned, Hunters Point South, that's thousands of units of affordable housing mm -hmm. that are being built, as well as, um, uh, and there's a number of projects that have a 80-20. Um, Queensbridge uh, Houses, which is the largest public housing project in the country, is in Long Island City, as well as Ravenswood and Astoria Houses. There's also a lot of, uh, especially as you get north of the plaza, there's housing that wasn't isn't public housing, but it's still you know modest uh, middle income housing. Um, I know that the administration is thinking hard about where's the best place to put more uh, housing. Obviously. Um, Long Island City sits right on so many transportation grids, it's a good place to be. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I think that, you know, we'll work with them, we're in conversations with them. The important thing is that as we accommodate perhaps more residential of all types, we also use, you know, leverage that energy to helping the other sectors as well. Sure. Um, because again, while it may not be as evident when you sort of walk around, there, there are really good jobs and there are good uh, co companies in there that are providing things that the city actually needs. You know, things like 
bread, concrete, um, financial services, uh, tech, um, ties, you know, you name it, it's there. And these are companies that are delivering to the city constantly, um, that are using the airports to deliver to the world, uh, using the bridges and tunnels to get east and west and north and south. So um, I, as I said, it is a big canvas if you take all of Long, city writ, Long Island City writ large. And I think as we work with the administration and they think through where they can meet their goals, you can paint with many colors on that canvas. It sure. doesn't have to be one solution in one place versus the other. Now, I wanted to ask you because it seems like while Long Island City is in a great location, you've been kind of bitten by the, the transportation uh, bug in terms of the, the 7 train I know was out of, of service a little bit last summer, the G train's out of service this summer. Does that, it, what, does that create kind of a, a headache for, for Long Island City residents? I know they have the ferry obviously as an alternative, but that kind of, you know, it's a, it, it's in a kind of a ripe area, kind of a nexus for, for transportation, but it's not available for. Right. and. Um, uh, you know, the last couple years, it's been 20 plus weekends, uh, last three years, I think, that we haven't had seven train service. And, you know, it's a, it's a problem. The, the repairs that are being done are, there's no question that they're needed, mm -hmm. right? And that at the end of the day, we will have enhanced service, which is what they're aiming towards. They're both right. trying to keep things safe, but they're also trying to make the seven train tracks able to accommodate many more trains. Sure. And anybody who has gotten on the 7 train or tried to get on the 7 train in Long Island City after it comes from Flushing is aware that it's beyond capacity. Right. Uh, that being said, there are areas that during these um, shutdowns are cut off. Um, the areas between Queens Plaza and Vernon Jackson along there, and while the city has provided shuttle buses, there are a lot, that's sort of our restaurant core, our entertainment core, our, you know, a number of our cultural institutions are there and weekend activity is essential to them sure. and to their businesses and it's um, you know a struggle to convince people that it's worth taking a shuttle bus from a train from a this from a that and so um, there's been a lot of discussion about you know why can't there be a direct shuttle from Grand Central um, uh, could we get the metro card on the ferry Things like that. And I know the MTA and city officials are working hard to try and figure out what can be done to to ease the burden. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it's always a problem when you have real repairs that need to be done. But nevertheless, these businesses depend on them. And we as a community depend on these businesses being strong. In addition to which, there's a lot of, as I was mentioning, the industrial businesses. Um, that are themselves 24-7 operations. And so on the weekends, they need transport right. for their workers. And, um, you know, it's, if, if you're getting off shift at two o'clock in the morning or something, and then you're riding a shuttle bus to a train, to a this, to a that, I mean, and let alone one of, uh, one of the older residents made the point very eloquently at one of the uh, hearings, you know, the Vernon Jackson stop is, it's uh, basically a one staircase down to the platform. Mm -hmm. That's very different than getting on at Queens Plaza where you may have to go basically four stories up to get to the train if you're someone carrying a stroller or an elderly person. So it is a real challenge for the community and uh, we all look forward to the day when it's over and uh, I know the MTA's thinking hard about what they can do to ease this and I hope that you know as we go into next year and into the fall closures that uh, we come up with good solutions. Elizabeth Luskin, the president of the Long Island City Partnership, thank you for joining us today. Thank you.